The Return of the Latter Rain, Chapter 7. Return to Battle Creek. The Religious Liberty Crises in America and in the Church. Many revivals occurred following the Minneapolis General Conference as the message sent from heaven was presented to the people. Nevertheless, continued opposition to Jones and Wagner and Ellen White greatly hindered the work and finally turned back the abundant outpouring of the Holy Spirit. J.H. Morrison and some of the other delegates to the conference left early and returned to Battle Creek with high-colored reports of a discouraging character. They reported that A.T. Jones was a crank, and it seemed as though it would break their hearts to have the people think otherwise. Many believed in the infallibility doctrine of the Battle Creek authors Uriah Smith, G.I. Butler, and others, and could not see the possibility of these men being on the wrong side of the controversy. You can find these comments in the Manuscripts and Memoirs, pages 129 and 136. Upon returning to Battle Creek, Ellen White learned of the many reports that had been brought back from Minneapolis, leading the people to believe that Sister White must be a changed woman and that her testimony had changed in its character. Speaking to the people in a meeting at Battle Creek, she was given opportunity to make her position plain, but not a word of response came from the men who should have stood with her. Not one ventured to say, I am with you, Sister White, I will stand by you. Although several shook hands with her following the meeting and were relieved to hear the truth of the matter, there were quite a number who held fast their evil surmisings and clung to the distorted representations made. It seemed to be their preference to believe the false reports. After an absence from Battle Creek, Ellen White would customarily speak at the tabernacle on her first Sabbath back in town. This she was invited to do, but because the impressions were so strong that she had changed, two church elders, brothers Amandon and Cicely, came on Sabbath morning inquiring as to what she planned to speak upon. Ellen White well understood the intent of the question and rebuked the elders, asking as well that A.T. Jones be given a chance to speak, the message given him of God. Quote, Brethren, you leave that matter with the Lord and Sister White, for neither the Lord nor Sister White will need to be dictated to by the brethren as to what subject she will bring before them. I am at home in Battle Creek, and we ask not permission to take the desk in the tabernacle. I take it as my rightful position accorded me of God. But there is Brother Jones, who cannot feel as I do, and who will wait an invitation from you. You should do your duty in regard to this matter and open the way before him. The elder stated they did not feel free to invite him to speak until they had consulted Brother Smith to know whether he would sanction it, for Elder Smith was older than they. I said, then do this at once, for time is precious, and there is a message to come to this people, and the Lord requires you to open the way. Close quote. 1888 Materials, pages 355 and 356. After nearly a week, with no invitation for Jones to speak to the people, Ellen White sent for the elders of the church to ask the reason for the delay. Prescott Amandon and Cicely brought a united testimony that Brother Smith had decided it would not be best to ask Jones because he took strong positions and carried the subject of national reform too far. 
Smith felt that Jones was rather extravagant in his expressions and took an extreme view, and he hardly thought it best to ask him to speak. Upon hearing their response, Ellen White felt deeply stirred with indignation at the persistent efforts to close the door to every ray of heaven's light. She bore a very plain testimony for about 15 minutes, and it was pointed and earnest as she had ever made it in her life. She told them her mind quite fully about that sort of planning. You find this in the 1888 materials, pages 241, 356, and 847. Footnote. This is a perfect example of those who were fighting against Jones because they felt he was an extremist when it came to national reform or religious liberty issues, and of Ellen White's unquestionable support. Similar accusations are leveled against Jones today, by those who claim he was an extremist in every area of religious liberty work. But Ellen White did not support Smith's accusations in 1888, nor would it seem she would support those today who misrepresent all his work as bad. Close footnote. Quote, I answered, If Elder Smith takes that position... God will surely remove him out of the way, for God has not given him the authority to say what shall come into the tabernacle from our own people and what shall not. But if he holds that position, we will secure a hall in the city, and the words God has given Brother Jones to speak, the people shall have them. I told them a little of how matters have been carried on at Minneapolis and stated the position I had taken, that Phariseeism had been at work leavening the camp here at Battle Creek, and the Seventh-day Adventist churches were affected. Spiritual weakness and blindness were upon the people who had been blessed with great light and precious opportunities and privileges. As reformers, they had come out of the denominational churches but they now act a part similar to that which the churches acted in 1844. We hoped that there would not be the necessity for another coming out. Close quote, 1888 Materials, pages 356 and 357. As if trying to keep Jones out of the tabernacle were not enough, arrangements were made to shut him out of the school for fear something should come in that would be at variance with what had been taught. In April of 1888, the General Conference Committee had suggested the appointment of A.T. Jones to teach at Battle Creek College. And although he came east with the expectation of teaching in the college, it looked as though there was to be no place given him. When the resolution to restrict What could be taught at the college failed to pass at the Minneapolis conference. The school board of trustees, led by Uriah Smith, realized they had taken no formal action about having A.T. Jones teach. Thus, they voted to employ Uriah Smith and F.D. Stark to teach the biblical course instead. Not long after, however, the general conference committee suggested that F.D. Starr go to Indiana because they were in a great strait for a man and once again advised the college to have a talk with Jones since he had come east by their advice. A special committee of three, made up of G.I. Butler, Uriah Smith, and W.W. Prescott, president of the Battle Creek College, had a long conference with Elder Jones. And what a conference it was. The committee insisted that he assure them in a very positive manner that if he should be employed to assist in the lectures, he would not knowingly teach any opinions contrary to those which the board desired to be taught. What they had failed to pass by resolution at Minneapolis, 
they now imposed upon Jones directly. Ellen White was incensed at such actions. A short time later, she asked if all the attempts to keep Jones out of the school and the tabernacle was inspired by the Spirit of God. Her answer? Certainly there was not the Spirit of inspiration upon you from God, but from another source. This situation led her to muse. How few comprehend or try to ascertain the mysteries of the rejection of the Jews and the calling of the Gentiles. 1888 Materials, page 259. Religious Liberty. Ellen White's 15-minute talk with the elders of the tabernacle was not without results. Brother Madden stirred around and gave out appointments for Sabbath and Sunday evenings so Jones could speak at the tabernacle. According to W.C. White, Jones spoke on religious liberty and did real well. Several prominent citizens were there, including Judge Graves and Ed Nichols, who were much pleased. Jones's presentations were printed in the Battle Creek Daily Journal, and 2,300 of the journals were given out. Because of the interest created, Jones was allowed to continue his presentations at the tabernacle. While leaders in the church spoke derogatorily of Jones's message and his style of presentation, a worldly paper praised him for both. The Battle Creek Daily Journal described his third meeting as such, quote, the very large and deeply attentive audiences which have attended these lectures are as indicative of the great interest taken in them by our citizens as they are complementary of the able and eloquent manner in which the subject has been presented. Mr. Jones, in his third lecture, spoke for over two hours, holding his audience in breathless attention throughout. Close quote. This is taken from the Battle Creek Daily Journal, December 11, 1883, page 3. The following week, Jones accompanied Ellen White to Porterville, Michigan, where meetings were held November 22nd through the 27th. Ellen White had been invited by Brother Van Horn and was happy to attend, hoping that by her presence, the prejudice against Jones and Wagner would be removed. During the morning meetings, when only our brethren were present, Ellen White spoke very plainly about the Minneapolis conference, stating the light the Lord had been pleased to give her in warnings and reproof for his people. She warned the brethren of the danger of becoming dwarfs in spiritual things because they were placing their trust upon one man, G.I. Butler. The men were separating themselves from God by giving homage to human beings. Ellen White also spoke of the atmosphere that had surrounded them by their laughing, jesting, and joking. 1888 Materials, pages 357 to 359. A.T. Jones gave three discourses at Potterville similar to the ones presented at Battle Creek, two of which related to our nation with the impending issues relating to church and state and the warning, the third angel's message, that must be given to our people. Although I.D. Van Horn reported in the review that there was no manifestation of levity or lightness and that Ellen White's testimony each day, evidently dictated by the Spirit of God, added much to the interest and power of the meeting. Her assessment was much different. Speaking in latter rain language, she stated plainly that their course at Minneapolis was cruelty to the Spirit of God and begged them to stop just where they were. She had hoped that the Potterville meetings would make a difference, but the position of Elder Butler and Elder Smith influenced them to make no change but stand where they did. 
No confession was made. The blessed meeting closed. Many were strengthened, but doubt and darkness enveloped some closer than before. The dew and showers of grace from heaven, which softened many hearts, did not wet their souls. This is quoted from the 1888 Materials, page 360. Ellen White had a good reason to be concerned. Throughout the 1880s, Sunday legislation and persecution for Sunday law violation had grown in strength and scope. But now, at a time when Seventh-day Adventists should be keenly interested in such topics, many were busy quibbling over doctrines and ignoring the religious liberty issues at stake. Between 1885 and 1887, nearly 20 Sabbath keepers in Arkansas alone had been charged with Sunday desecration and fined up to $500 each. In 1887, the Prohibition Party and the Women's Christian Temperance Union sided with the National Reform Association in its drive to establish Sunday laws as a means of improving American morality. In early 1888, the well-known Roman Catholic Cardinal James Gibbons joined forces with many Protestants in endorsing a petition to Congress on behalf of National Sunday legislation. This Sunday movement peaked on May 21, 1888, when Senator H. W. Blair introduced a bill into the United States Senate to promote the observance of the Lord's Day as a day of religious worship. Only a few days later, Blair submitted a proposal to amend the United States Constitution and Christianize the nation's public school system. This was the first such legislation to go before Congress since the establishment of the Advent Movement in the 1840s. Amidst these monumental movements, which were seen as fulfillments of Bible prophecy, one of the greatest controversies in the history of the Adventist Church had taken place in Minneapolis. There, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit, which would prepare a people to stand during such times, were attributed to fanaticism. Ellen White had spoken pointedly at the conference, quote, because the ideas of some are not exactly in accordance with their own on every point of doctrine, the great question of the nation's religious liberty now involving so much is to many a matter of little consequence, close quote. 1888 Materials, page 1565. Seeing the opposition against Jones and Wagner as a result of the Minneapolis controversy greatly disturbed Ellen White as well. Because both men were so actively involved in the church's religious liberty work, prejudice against them would likely spill over into this important work. Both Jones and Wagner were co-editors of the American Sentinel, the church's monthly religious liberty magazine that began in 1886 and were presumably the most active and well-versed writers and teachers on the subject. Both men had been asked to read over Ellen White's new edition of The Great Controversy to give careful criticism and corrections before its printing in 1888. Footnote. It is likely that Jones or Wagner wrote notes regarding current events in religious liberty, which were included in the appendix of the 1888 edition of The Great Controversy. On page 565, Ellen White states that, quote, Catholicism is gaining ground upon every side, close quote. A footnote refers the reader to the appendix for added information. On page 573, Ellen White states that in the movements now in progress in the United States to secure for the institutions and usages 
of the church, the support of the state. Protestants are following in the steps of the papists. Again, the reader is referred to the appendix for added information that was not found in Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, the 1884 edition. According to the White Estate, Jones or Wagner most likely wrote these appendix notes. Both notes were removed in the 1911 edition, probably because they no longer represented current events. The point is that the 1888 edition of the Great Controversy was produced for that very time, 1888, to alert its readers to what was taking place in the United States and around the world. Ellen White was confident enough in the work of Jones and Wagner that she allowed their input to be added to the appendix. It is also a fact that God was sending a most precious message to prepare the church to share the same message with the world. Sadly, the 1888 edition of the Great Controversy ended up sitting idle in the Review and Herald storehouse for nearly two years, primarily as the result of the opposition to the message and the messengers. Close footnote. Not only that, but Jones's preaching on the subject received a good response from prominent citizens when he presented at the tabernacle. As the first Adventist to stand before the United States Senate, testifying before the Committee on Education and Labor against the Blair Sunday Bill on December 13, 1888, his efforts were just as praiseworthy. Although Jones was basically self-educated, having never had the opportunity to attend an Adventist school as a student, his defense of freedom of conscience and religious liberty before the Senate was impressive. The arguments he presented were similar to those shared at the tabernacle, but during the 90 minutes he was allowed to speak, he was interrupted by the chairman alone, Senator Blair, 169 times. Yet the Lord gave Jones words to speak, and the legislation died with the expiration of the 50th Congress. Footnote. Is it possible that we Adventists do not realize our indebtedness to God for sending A.T. Jones to the defense of the church as well as to the nation in regard to religious liberty? One cannot appreciate Jones's work for religious liberty, however, without first reading his works, many of which have been reprinted. Renewed interest has been developing, however. Liberty Magazine recently reprinted one of Jones's talks along these lines entitled, What is Patriotism in the United States? and mailed it to their subscribers list. Each year, the North American Religious Liberty Association presents the A.T. Jones Medal to one of its own who exemplifies the best of Jones's contribution to the field of religious liberty. This includes a willingness to speak truth with power, applying his or her talents to the practical business of researching, writing, speaking, and organizing in the advance of liberty and displaying through action a dedication to the gospel principle of religious liberty. Close footnote. Week of Prayer Revival Only two days after Jones's appearance before the U.S. Senate, he returned to Battle Creek to participate with Ellen White in Week of Prayer meetings, which were scheduled from December 15 to the 22nd. Prior to the week of prayer, Ellen White gave warnings from the pulpit of the tabernacle and through the pages of the review of the approaching crises. She lamented that it had not been in the order of God that light had been kept from the people, the very present truth which they needed for that time. The outpouring of the Spirit of God 
which was to prepare them for such a crisis, was being held at bay, which was to prepare them for such a crisis. She understood the lack of readiness on the part of the people of God and that many had sat in calm expectation of this event for years. It was a time for action, not for indolence and spiritual stupor. Quote, a great crisis awaits the people of God. Very soon our nation will attempt to enforce upon all the observance of the first day of the week as a sacred day. There must be among God's commandment-keeping people more spirituality and a deeper consecration to God. Unless you arise to a higher, holier attitude in your religious life, you will not be ready for the appearing of our Lord. As great light has been given them, God expects proportionate zeal, devotion, and faithfulness upon the part of his people. But there will be proportionate darkness, unbelief, and blindness as the truth is not appreciated and acted upon. If our people continue in the listless attitude in which they have been, God cannot pour upon them his spirit. They are unprepared to cooperate with him. They do not realize the threatened danger and are not awake to the situation. The third angel's message comprehends more than many suppose. What interpretation do they give to the passage which says an angel descended from heaven and the earth was lightened with his glory? This is not a time when we can be excused in activity. The people need to be aroused in regard to the dangers of the present time. The watchmen are asleep. We are years behind. Close quotes. This is quoted from Ellen White in an article called The Approaching Crises, the Review and Herald Extra, December 11, 1888. Footnote. In a user-friendly guide to the 1888 message, George Knight presents the idea that, quote, Seventh-day Adventists did not miss the prophetic significance of the Blair Bills, close quote. That the, quote, high emotional pitch of the participants at the 1888 General Conference, close quote, was largely due to, quote, the fact that Adventists felt that they already faced the end of time, close quote. Thus, it is not difficult to see why some of the Adventist leaders reacted violently and emotionally to what Jones and Wagner were presenting. These are on his pages 32 and 33. Ellen White, however, offers a more balanced perspective. Many Adventists may have been aware intellectually of the events taking place, but the watchmen were asleep unprepared, and did not realize the threatened danger. Close footnote. In a sermon delivered at Battle Creek on December 8, Ellen White pleaded with the people to get ready for the week of prayer by humbling their hearts before God. She warned that they were drawing near to the close of probation. And there was a great work to do for God. The time had come when the people's attention was to be called to the sanctuary in heaven. She exclaimed that God was working for his people and that they would not be left in darkness. He would have their eyes anointed that they might discern between the workings of the powers of darkness and the movings of the Spirit of God. In an article printed for the week of prayer, Ellen White wrote of the coming crises and told the people plainly, quote, We have been asleep and our lamps are going out. The Laodicean message is applicable to the people of God at this time. They are saying, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Close quote. 
she warned the brethren of the grievous sin of Phariseeism that had come into their midst, which was leading them to feel that we are righteous and all our acts are meritorious when we are far from cherishing the right spirit toward God or toward our brethren. In their resistance to the message brought by Jones and Wagner, they had been making a man an offender for a word. As the week of prayer began, Ellen White tried to arouse the attention of the brethren to what their true feelings were in regard to Jones and Wagner and their work being done for religious liberty. Regardless of their claims, their actions spoke louder than words. The warnings in the American Sentinel had not influenced the people as they should have because there had not been a united recommendation by those in leadership positions. As a result, the church was far behind in making preparations for the work, and as a result, God's blessing had been withdrawn. Quote, Much might have been done with the sentinel if counter-influences had not been at work to hinder it. Even though nothing may be said against it, actions reveal the indifference that is felt in regard to it. The sentinel has been, in God's order, one of the voices sounding the alarm that the people might hear and realize their danger and do the work required at the present time. The voice of the true witness has been heard in reproof, but has not been obeyed. Close quote. Quote, Let every worker for God comprehend the situation and place the sentinel before our churches, explaining its contents and urging home the warnings and facts it contains. Let not unsanctified feelings lead anyone to resist the appeals of the Spirit of God. The Word of God is not silent in regard to this momentous time, and it will be understood by all who do not resist His Spirit. The Lord's messages of light have been before us for years, but there have been influences working indirectly to make of no effect the warnings coming through the sentinel and the testimonies and through other instrumentalities which the Lord sends to his people. Stand not in the way of this light. Close quote. This is quoted from a Review and Herald article called Our Duties and Obligations by Ellen White, pages 794 and 795, December 18, 1888. Such appeals delivered through the pages of the review, along with messages given during the week of prayer, began to produce results. Ellen White, A.T. Jones, and J.O. Corliss labored earnestly, speaking at the sanitarium in the early morning and at the office chapel and at the tabernacle. Jones spoke on the current issue of the religious amendment, but according to Ellen White, the principal topic dwelt upon was justification by faith, and this truth came as meat in due season upon the people of God. The living oracles of God were presented in new and precious light. The message given was not alone the commandments of God, a part of the third angel's message, but also the faith of Jesus which comprehends more than is generally supposed. Thus Ellen White could joyfully proclaim, quote, The truth as it is in Jesus, accompanied by divine energy, has been brought before the people, and we have reason to praise God. Close quote. This is quoted from Ellen White's article, Revival Work in the Battle Creek Church, Review and Herald, February 12, 1889, pages 106 and 107. Footnote. The 1888 message presented by Jones and Wagner 
was very closely connected with the subject of religious liberty and the work of the Holy Spirit preparing a people to stand in the day of God. The fact that Sunday laws were closer to being enacted than at any other time in American history was a powerful and compelling evidence that God had begun to pour out the latter rain, the message of Christ our righteousness, and that the loud cry was about to go forth with unprecedented power. Close quote. Close footnote. The message of righteousness by faith was recognized as having greater significance because it was presented in the context of religious liberty and freedom of conscience, the very foundation upon which God's government is based. The Holy Spirit revealed the deep significance of these truths as they were related to new and startling movements in the development of the religious amendment to the Constitution. This gave the meetings more than usual interest as the application of prophecy was plainly made to their own time. The message born had a wonderful effect on those who heard it. There were many not of our faith, who were deeply stirred with the importance of doing something and doing it now in the struggle for religious freedom. Ellen White could candidly proclaim, God has sent messengers, Jones and Wagner, who have studied their Bibles to find what is truth and studied the movements of those who are acting their part in fulfilling prophecy in bringing about the religious amendment. And shall no voice be raised of direct warning to arouse the churches to their danger? She saw the time was soon coming when those not of our faith would, as a result of this message, come to the front, gird themselves with the whole armor of God, and exalt his law, adhere to the faith of Jesus, and maintain the cause of religious liberty. This is quoted from 188 Materials, pages 378 and 379. Footnote. We must not forget that the great adversary has worked for nearly 1,500 years through the papal church to not only do away with the law of God, but also to trample on the faith of Jesus, augmented by taking away liberty of conscience. The papacy is well adapted to meet the wants of all these. It is prepared for two classes of mankind, embracing nearly the whole world, those who would be saved by their merits and those who would be saved in their sins. Here is the secret of its power. The Catholic Church has also anathemized those who assert the liberty of conscience and of religious worship, also all such as maintain that the church may not employ force. Ellen G. White, Great Controversy, pages 572 and 564. The three angels' messages counter such falsehood by proclaiming the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus and by preserving Liberty of conscience for all, of which the Sabbath is a sign. Close footnote. Because of the interest created by the week of prayer meetings, even among visitors and patients at the sanitarium, meetings held in various locations in Battle Creek continued for a month. Writing a short time later about the experience, Ellen White expressed joy at the sight of heaven's light shining upon the people and the positive results. Quote, Many have sought the Lord with confession of sins and contrition of soul. Those who have hereto been almost destitute of faith have discerned its simplicity and have been enabled to lay hold of the promises of God. Their faith was directed to Christ, our righteousness. 
Meetings were held in the college, which were intensely interesting. The Spirit of the Lord wrought upon hearts, and there was a precious work done in the conversion of souls. There had been no excitement felt or manifested. The work has been accomplished by the deep movings of the Spirit of God, as one after another of these students of the Battle Creek College heareth to ignorant of the truth and of the saving grace of God, espouse the cause of Christ, what joy was there in the heavenly courts, and gratitude to God was expressed by the workers. Meetings were held in the sanitarium hospital. There were many whose minds had been clouded with doubt, but the light received from the explanation of Scripture encouraged their faith, while the truth was revealed to their minds and hearts in a light in which they had never before seen it. They realized something of how dishonoring to their maker was their unbelief. We deeply regretted that the meetings could not have been longer continued. Meetings were held with the workers of the publishing house. Many good testimonies were born. And it made my heart glad to see those who had been connected with the publishing work for a period of 30 years rejoice as young converts rejoice in their first love. They express their gladness and gratitude of heart for the sermons that had been preached by Brother A.T. Jones. They saw the truth, goodness, mercy and love of God as they never before had seen it. They humbled their hearts, confessed their sins, and removed everything that had separated their souls from God, and the Lord put a new song into their mouth, even praises unto his name. Oh, how we long to have every soul come out into the liberty of the sons of God. Will any of these who have tasted of the bread of life ever loathe the manna that has been so sweet to their souls as these messages? Close quote. This is quoted from Ellen White's article in the Review and Herald called Revival Work in the Battle Creek Church on February 12, 1889. It was thus that the blessings of that week of prayer extended through the church. Confessions were made. Those who had robbed God in tithes and offerings confessed their wrong and made restitution. And many were blessed of God who had never felt that God had forgiven their sins. All these precious fruits evidenced the work of God. Even some that had so recently been fighting against the messengers God had sent began to recognize their sin. During one of the week of prayer meetings, W. W. Prescott arose to give a testimony. He attempted to speak, but his heart was too full. There he stood five minutes in complete silence, weeping. When he did speak, he said, I'm glad to be a Christian. He made very pointed remarks. His heart seemed to be broken by the Spirit of God. Seeing the president of the college in such a state of contrition had an effect on others. Ellen White invited those who had not accepted the truth and those who had not the evidence of their acceptance was God to come forward. It seemed that the whole company were on the move. That night, many more bore precious testimonies that the Lord had forgiven their sins and given them a new heart. The words of truth spoken by Elder Jones had been blessed to their souls. One of the brethren, who had been personally present during the week of prayer, described Jones's consecrated labors during the meetings. Quote, Brother A.T. Jones has been doing most of the preaching. I wish you could have heard some of his sermons. Some of his sermons are as good, I think, as I have ever heard. They are all new, too. 
He is original in his preaching, and in his practical preaching seems very tender and deeply feels all he says. Close quote. It is no wonder that Ellen White declared, God has given these men, Jones and Wagner, a work to do and a message to bear which is present truth for this time. Wherever this message comes, its fruits are good. This is quoted from the 1888 Materials, page 228. Grieved the Spirit of God. It would be nice if we could end this chapter here, but history does not allow us to do so. Even though many people in Battle Creek were receiving blessings from heaven through the labors of Jones and Wagner, opposition was still running high. Ellen White could rejoice that at last an opening was made for Brother Jones, but it was not pleasant to fight every inch for any privileges and advantages to bring the truth before the people. As the week of prayer began, Ellen White longed to hear those who had considered it a virtue to brace themselves against light and evidence, acknowledge the movings of the Spirit of God, cast away their unbelief, and come to the light. She knew that unless they did this, their path would become darker for light unconfessed and unacknowledged and unimproved becomes darkness to those who refuse it. The longer they waited to acknowledge the light which they had scorned, the harder it would be for them to go back and gather up the rays. The first step taken in the path of unbelief and rejection of light is a dangerous thing. Quote, there was precious truth and light presented before the people, but hearts that were obdurate received no blessing. They could not rejoice in the light which, if accepted, would have brought freedom and peace and strength and courage and joy to their souls. God was at work. But those who had been pursuing a course of their own devising felt more confirmed and determined to resist. What shall we name this element? It is rebellion, as in the days of Israel. The Lord wrought in our midst, but some did not receive the blessing. They have been privileged to hear the most faithful preaching of the gospel and had listened to the message God had given his servants to give them with their hearts padlocked. They did not turn unto the Lord, but used all their powers to pick some flaws in the messengers and in the message, and they grieved the Spirit of God. A woe is pronounced upon all such unbelief and criticism as was revealed in Minneapolis and as was revealed in Battle Creek. Evidence at every step that God was at work has not changed the manifest attitude of those who in the very beginning pursued a course of unbelief which was an offense to God. With this barrier they themselves had erected, they, like the Jews, were seeking something to strengthen their unbelief and make it appear they were right. Stand out of the way, brethren. Do not interpose yourselves between God and his work. If you have no burden of the message yourself, then prepare the way for those who have the burden of the message. Satan is doing his utmost to have those who believe present truth deceived, that those who have accepted unpopular truth, who have had great light and great privileges, shall have the spirit that will pervade the world, even if it is in a less degree, yet it is the same principle that when it has a controlling power over minds leads to certain results. The result 
is the same as with the Jews. Fatal hardness of heart. Close quote. This is quoted from the 1888 materials, pages 366 to 369, 378, 379, and 381. At the very heart of the work in Battle Creek, there was opposition to heaven-sent light. Footnote. There were other factors in Battle Creek that kept some of the people from hearing and receiving the message presented. A Christmas program had been planned involving many of the young children dressed in costumes. Ellen White expressed her concern in her diary notes for December 24. Quote, There was much arrangement made in the sanitarium, and a large number were not present at the week of prayer meetings because of this. Close quote. Ellen White communicated her concern over the great amount of time and labor that was spent in preparation for the program. Quote, While these painstaking efforts were being made to get up the performances, meetings were being held of the deepest interest which should have engaged the attention and which called for the presence of every soul lest they should lose something of the message the Master had sent to them. Close quote. Sensing the prophetic time in which they were living and the present truth message being given, Ellen White urged the teachers to discern the light so they might pass it on to the children. Quote, Oh, let the teachers in the Sabbath school be thoroughly imbued with the spirit of the message for this time, carrying that message into all their labor, labor to save them, children, Point them to Jesus, who so loved them that he gave his life for them. Repeat to them the precious assurance which God himself has given to them. Exodus 34, 6 and 7 was quoted. Jesus must be presented in simplicity to the children as a sin-pardoning Savior, offering within the veil the blood of his atonement. Tell them it is in vain to think they can make themselves better and promise to amend, for this will not remove one spot or stain of sin. But the way to obtain a sense of sin and true repentance is to cast themselves just as they are upon the declared mercy and revealed love of God. Close quote. This was quoted from Letter 5, December 26, 1888, Manuscript Releases, Volume 19, pages 300 to 305, close footnote. Instead of the brethren preparing the way for the loud cry and latter rain, they were interposing themselves between God and his work. The very spirit which leads worldly men to pass laws that restrict liberty of conscience was also active in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Unless something changed, the result would be fatal hardness of heart. We can be thankful that even though the Spirit of God was grieved at Minneapolis and at Battle Creek, the Lord did not give up on his church. Unbelief, criticism, and resistance were prevalent among the leading brethren. Yet the people scattered across the country must have a chance to hear the most precious message. We will take a look at the results of hearing and receiving that message in the next chapters. This is the end.